Alboard! Ja tervetuloa seuraamaan RTVn iltalähetystä. Tänään meillä on vieraana Sysi Hansen uudesta Seelannista. Ja tämä seuraava keskustelu tullaan käydä, käymään englannin kielellä. Jos teillä on kysymyksiä Sysille, niin laittakaa sinne englanninkieliset kysymykset chattiin, niin minä sieltä osaan poimia niitä Sysille. Mutta nyt käännämme kielen siis englanniksi. Ja Susie, welcome to the, our show. Thank you, Timor. I'm very glad to be here after our unfortunate start early this morning. Well, uh, we are still living here in uh, Wednesday, but uh, uh, you are already in Thursday there. Yes, eight o'clock Thursday morning. So, Susie. Uh, can we a little bit discuss about those things what we was talking in our first uh, uh, first uh, meeting and uh, our first uh, interview? Because all those uh, listeners probably doesn't know your backgrounds and and how you're familiar uh, about this UFO thing. And I already remember that uh, you are uh, familiar with uh, UFO things from from your childhood already. But please uh, tell me a little bit about this story. Okay, and would you like the the UFO sighting side of it too, Timor? Well, you can choose what you want to tell. Okay. Well, um, my experiences, um, start, contact experiences, started in childhood, um, and I would have memories of uh, of these unusual glowing figures appearing in my room at night and telling me that they were taking me somewhere with them. I don't didn't remember all of the details of what happened. I was quite clearly put into some altered state. But um, this continued right throughout my childhood. And I did have dreamlike memories, if I can put it that way, of actually being in white rooms and performing tasks, learning how to do things with my mind, um, being mixing with other unusual looking children. So uh, this continued through my childhood and uh, through my teenage years I didn't have very many memories and I, I'm guessing that that's because during your teenage years there's a lot going on in your life. Um, you have your all your external exams at college etc and, um, and I just don't have a lot of memories of that particular time. But the next uh, big incident that happened in my life was when I was 20 and um, I was traveling with a flatmate on a lonely country road late afternoon and um, we were basically um, swallowed up by an enormous light that came over our car and we had 90 minutes missing time. This was a very terrifying experience uh, having had that sighting and then this happened a few minutes later and then seeming to wake up um, an hour and a half later and not knowing what had happened and finding that it was now dark. So um, that really uh, catapulted me or threw me into not only um, sighting investigation in New Zealand at the age of 20, but into trying to investigate what had happened to me uh, and during this time. And it took many years of flashbacks and memories coming back um, and other incidents happening one after the other over the years that um, I began to put together a picture of what was happening uh, to me. And I believed at that time that I was being visited by um, the occupants of UFOs. Uh, and taken somewhere and taken on board their craft. I began to have clearer and clearer memories as time went by into my late 20s and 30s. I had a much clearer memories of what was taking place. Um, by that time, I was married and I had two small children, so it was quite difficult to um, to actually assimilate this into my life and carry on as a school teacher and a mother and a community member um, with all dealing with all of this at the same time. There were very little there was very little information in New Zealand at that time concerning um, what we called in those days abductions or contacts. Um, slowly some of those books by well known authors such as Bud Hopkins and Dr. David David Jacobs and Dr. John Mack started coming into New Zealand and um, it was quite terrifying to read those books because uh, they had some quite negative perspectives, not John Mack's books, but the other two did. And um, 
so it was quite frightening um, being caught, feeling quite alone here and not knowing many other people in New Zealand who were experiencing the same. So as years went by, I, I think I gained more and more understanding and more of a rapport with the Greys who, who I was having contact with. And um, I first spoke about my experiences publicly at a conference in here in Auckland in 1997, and I've been speaking internationally ever since. I've written a book called The Dual Soul Connection, The, um, the Alien Agenda for Human Advancement, and uh, that really outlines my life to this point and some of the experiences that I've been through and what I have learned from them. Uh, interesting and fascinating uh, your story and, and uh, those uh, childhood uh, experiences uh, uh, started at the age of what, was, was it five years old? No, um, uh, my first memories are around the age of eight. Um, oh. I did have some unusual dreams prior to that, which I attribute to the contact, but the real real memories of communication and discussion with the ETs uh, started when I was eight years old, and, and I have quite good recollection of that. Mm -hmm. Well, it started quite uh, early and, and uh, continued mm. uh, through the childhood and uh, also adulthood. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, up until this day, although the contact in more recent years has changed in the way that it occurs, I think fewer people are being taken on board craft now. It's much more um, communication through the soul state, not necessarily the physical body being taken on to a craft anymore. I think um, experiencers who've had a lifetime of these kinds of experiences don't necessarily need to be um, taken in the physical state anymore. It's more likely to be uh, the soul state or the spirit state, uh, your consciousness. Um, but having said that, a couple of, two or three months ago, I did have an experience of being on a craft and interestingly this was just before the the uh, virus broke out worldwide and um, and I had recollection of being with a large group of humans who were receiving some kind of inoculation so we were in lines waiting for some kind of inoculation so that was um, a very interesting memory from recent times that well, coincides with what's happening today uh, can you share it uh, more detail I only have um, a, a brief memory of being in a white, large white room with a lot of people. We were being um, just waiting to move up in line and we knew that we were receiving some kind of inoculation. Um, we were not told, of, we were told there were events coming up on the planet, but we were not specifically told in my memory that I have me retained memory of. Um, we were not told about the events that are happening now. But we were warned that there were things coming up and that we would have to be careful and we were advised to be to really look after ourselves, look after our immune systems and uh, to be relatively quiet in some respects, um, not like I'm doing an interview now, but I mean not being controversial, too controversial or, um, you know, making too many waves, attracting attention to ourselves. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um those um, alien race, what you have been contacted uh, through the childhood, do I remember right that uh, they were those, those classic ones, those small ones, large head and grey scale? Was it like, something like yes, this? Yes, they, they were a species of grey. Some of them were the short grey, some were the tall grey, but there were other species as well, like um, on a several occasions I've seen mantid uh, entities and a lot of mixtures of uh, of greys mixed with other species, but also uh, quite tall, tall, slim, human-like um, beings who were very advanced in their technology and in their intelligence. Mm -hmm. So, um, in some some of those uh, experiences, what you have had has been in a physical level, but in some point that they turn it like a more in conscious states or goes like this? Yes, um, uh, in my earlier life, right through to my fort into my 40s, um, was very much taken on board in a physical state. But right from childhood, I do have um, memories of being of going on board as a ball of light. So I would consider that would be in the soul state. 
um, arriving in a ball of light and then manifesting um, as as a body. So um, how that works, I don't know, but um, a lot of experiencers report that, that they arrive on board as a ball of light and then they assume a body, either their own physical body or sometimes um, that of a grey and they perform work on the craft or attend a lecture or a meeting, are given information, uh, take part in healing or whatever. Mm. How much you can uh, remember from those earlier uh, um, abductation or how to say it, uh, those conductees? Uh, when uh, you was taking the, the craft uh, by your physical body, how much you can remember from those experiences? I can remember quite a lot from those experiences. Um, and I speak um, at conferences about some of the technology that I have seen on the craft. And um, in 2018, I did a speech at the UFO Congress in Phoenix, Ariz in Phoenix Arizona, in the States. And... Um, and I, I talked about some of the medical type of um, um, technology I've seen as well as uh, technology used to, to uh, fly craft, etc. So quite a, a range of technology, technology used to move around the inside of the craft from one level to another. So um, I actually have retained over the years quite a lot of specific detail of um, what the rooms are like, what the communications are like, what, what it feels like to communicate with them, um, some of the activities that take place on board craft, the technology, what the inside of some of the small craft are like, what the inside of the larger craft are like, um, and, and some of the other places that we've been taken, like, for example, an undersea base and underground bases, um, which, interestingly, um, in many respects match the details of some of my close friends overseas who are also experiencers. So for example, Dr. Um, Robert Salas, Captain Robert Salas, um, who talks about the nuclear incident at Malmstrom Air Force Base in the late 60s. Um, he has recollection of being at an underground base where there was a particular kind of glass office and I have a very distinct memory of that same kind of office structure um, in an underground base. So there are a lot of corroborative evidence has come forward over the years and in the speech I did in um, the States on technology and that's on my YouTube channel, Suzanne Hansen channel, um, there are speeches there on technology and um, I had quite a lot of corroboration from other experiencers who were able to exactly describe, for example, a handheld piece of apparatus that was used to scan inside the body. So um, it's been very heartening for me over recent years to get this kind of corroboration. And after my speech at the Congress, I was approached by scientists and uh, medical professionals who'd attended the conference, or they wrote an email to me later um, telling me that we are trying to uh, produce the same kind of technology as what I described that the ETs already have. However, the missing component that we don't have is that consciousness input or that consciousness aspect of the technology that assists in its operation. We haven't managed to um, be able to do that adequately yet. Mm. Lately, I have uh, seen those, my, uh, would I say, lucid dreams or anyway, dreams where I have been in with uh, full consciousness. I have uh, seen how they try to uh, connect uh, technical, uh, like robots, uh, to the human consciousness. Have you um, seen any kind of that, that kind of uh, uh, technology during your uh, trips there? Um, not not connecting to robots, but um, I have seen, I have experienced, pardon? Uh, some kind of androids or something, uh, biological forms. Right. Yes, um, I haven't, uh, no one's tried to connect my consciousness to anything like that, an android, but I have used a lot of technology, uh, for example, when I was instructed how to fly a small scout craft, um, my consciousness then was connected to that technology of the craft to enable me to fly it and instruct the craft, if I can put it that way. 
um, yes. but also some of the medical technology um, and much of the technology on craft, you, you connect to it um, first with your consciousness before you can operate it. Okay, that's uh, quite interesting. Um, well, uh, one of those, uh, what I have seen uh, during my dreams, uh, that uh, example, uh, that kind of insection that you are giving uh, and uh, this, uh, to the, those blood vessels, and it will uh, take all blocks out, all, all those uh, blocks from uh, blood vessels, that kind of liquid which goes around blood circulation and takes all diseases out from the blood. Mm -hmm. Have you heard anything mm -hmm. about this or seen? Um, I have seen um, a, a kind of tech, not, not that specifically, but I have seen technology where um, they can see into the body, where um, they, they place a piece of apparatus above the body or they place the bed underneath the apparatus if it's attached to the ceiling and then this kind of beam comes down on you. I have no idea what that beam is made out of, what operates it, I should say. But um, once that beam contacts with the body, they can extend the, the beam um, to cover the whole body or just to cover a specific area. And in that area where it, it touches the body, you can see inside the body, you can either see the bone structure or the vascular system or the organs or whatever it is that they want to see, that's all that they will see. Yeah. Um, they can go right down to a cellular level with zooming in on what's in the body. Uh, they can make adjustments to the body accordingly. And um, we are currently in the States tr trying to emulate that. So I was approached after my speech at the Congress by a medical specialist who said that um, he actually sells this particular piece of machinery. There's only five so far in the world and um, they are attempt attempting to look into the body with that machinery. And they've um, it costs billions of dollars just for one machine. It is like a combination of X-ray and MRI scan but it doesn't have the same capacity and ease of operation or accuracy as what the ETs have got in it. Of course, it hasn't got that um, magnification aspect either. Yeah. But interesting that you talk about the blood circulating around. They are able to take out something presumably from the DNA. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're referring to, Timur? Well, uh, it was uh, more like that. Um, uh, what I saw that uh, uh, like uh, I had those uh, diseases like uh, those uh, well, uh, diabetes and so on, but uh, mm. this was uh, going a uh, little fight, in, fight uh, liquid was what was putting uh, to the human and it was going uh, through the blood circulation all over the place and uh, all over the body and, and it was uh, kind of purifying that blood from those, uh, uh, no, like a diabetes, <laughs> diabetes okay. things. That's interesting. Um, I have seen um, them doing something similar, but with light. So they stood, they stood me in front of a, a white screen, and there were eight ETs or eight greys at different cons consoles, like little computer consoles, in a half circle, and they were directing um, beams of coloured light at my body, and some were as finer than a hair and some were quite broad, um, much bigger beams of light that, that um, were directed at different parts of the body. And they told me that, that what they were doing was they were, they were tracking how the emotions um, affect our health right from birth and, uh, and trauma. And so they were tracking right back through my life what I had experienced in my life and how it had affected my physical body and my health. So I thought that was uh, a really interesting piece of technology that they were using on humans to investigate and understand um, our health problems better. Quite interesting, quite interesting. Uh, have you ever seen uh, that kind of device which uh, takes you to the uh, natural uh, lives what you probably have lived? It's some kind of machine with uh, uh, <coughs> like a glass bottles and there is those 
different uh, spirals and when you touch it you uh, will uh, get information about your past lives. Have you ever discovered anything like this there? No, I haven't, but I have seen um, a chair that you sit on, uh, a specific kind of computer that has a, a seat attached to it, I'll put it that way, where you sit and you can basically, you tap into your consciousness taps into the computer technology and, um, and you are able to uh, basically like a video view other aspects of your soul's being. So that's a similar thing, but using quite different technology to achieve the same end by the sounds of it. Well, that sounds quite interesting. I noticed that uh, in chat room there has been uh, coming this uh, Italian exopolitic Olli Paiola, welcome. <laughs> so, uh, if you have a question to the, uh, Susie, you can write it uh, down in, uh, in English language and uh, then I just picking up from the chat room and, uh, and then uh, uh, say it, ask it from uh, Susie. So please, if you have uh, something to question, just ask. Okay, uh, how about uh, any other kind of technology what you have been uh, uh, seeing in uh, those uh, during uh, your trips? Uh, uh, do you do you remember something else about this? This is very fascinating subject. Yeah, yes, well, there's quite a lot of bits of technology I've seen. Um, I talk about uh, what I call a light elevator, um, what what I originally called liquid light, mm -hmm. and um, this was in childhood and right throughout my life I've traveled in these um, elevators that move from one level of the craft to another. So it looks like a clear perspex or glass tube and a door slides back on it and inside is this uh, amazing light such as I have never seen. It's sparkling white and sparkling blue and there seems to be light moving up and down. There seems to be this movement of the light up and down at the same time. And um, when you step into it, there's, as a human anyway, there's this moment of blackness. And um, I guess that's how you, when your consciousness taps into the, the I don't know, the, the function of the machine. And um, all you do is think of a symbol which you know represents a different level of the craft. And um, just like magic, you're there. You don't, you don't feel any movement. You don't, uh, it doesn't seem to take any time. You don't have a feeling of going up or down. You're just suddenly there. And the door opens and you step out. Now, I've, I've had a few questions about this technology over the years in my mind, but I don't recall ever asking the greys the questions. Maybe I did, but um, one question I have is, what happens if you're in the, the machine going up and there's uh, someone else or another grey coming down at the same time? I don't know how it operates, but it seems to be able to transport um, the body in some altered state or some form instantaneously, uh, a bit Star Trekish, I know, but mm. but um, that's how I recalled it. So I wrote about this um, years ago in an article and um, put it on a website. And when I was preparing for a speech in the States at one stage, um, I thought I'd try to find other experiencers who might have seen something similar. So I began v visiting other experiencer sites, and um, and I found one where there was art. Um, by experiences, so I had a look at that, and uh, I was absolutely shocked um, because there was this drawing which was exactly the same as the drawings that I've done of this piece of of um, technology. So I contacted the artist and said, "Is this just from your imagination that you've drawn this, or is this actually from an experience?" And he came back to me and said, no, this is from an experience I had in the 80s or 90s. And um, I'm an experiencer. This is I, what I recall. And I said, well, I have seen something exactly the same as what you have drawn. Tell me what you recall about this piece of equipment. So I didn't feed him with information. I didn't give him any details. I just asked him to tell me about his, his uh, piece of uh, technology. 
And he came back telling me, well, it's like an elevator. It moves between floors. And when you step into it, um, it feels like liquid light. Well, that really was um, a great thing for me to hear because that's exactly the term, exactly the same words that I'd used to describe it, how the light felt like liquid on your skin or like velvet fabric on your skin. So we communicated for a little while and uh, he gave me permission to use his his image um, in my speeches. Um, when I was speaking in Australia on one occasion, I had a young teenage girl and her mother come up to me and the girl showed me some drawings that she'd done of her own experiences and there was the same kind of drawing again. And I asked her to describe it and she said, well, I call it the teleporter because it shifts you from one level of the craft to another. So there we had three people from Australia, New Zealand and the States who draw the same thing and can describe it in exactly the same way. So if that isn't proof of contact, evidence of, of contact, well, what is? What more can, can experiences do mm. other than find this corroborative evidence where people are able to give exactly the same description of a piece of technology on craft? Well, that is quite... Uh... <laughs> Quite fascinating thing. Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you about telling uh, those uh, uh, technological uh, things. Uh, I know that uh, when people talk about those uh, UFO technology, they are more, uh, <laughs> they might be get trouble with, uh, with that. Uh, have, you, have you had uh, that kind of situation that when you have a talk about uh, technology, then uh, somebody will warn you about it? <clears throat> Yes, Timo, I have. Um, and I've only just been speaking about this um, recently publicly, actually, and I don't know if it's going to get me into trouble, but <laughs> <laughs> but here goes. Um, when I attended and spoke at the uh, UFO Congress in 2018 in the States, um, the theme of that particular conference was alien technology. So that was when um, Luis Elizondo was was quite prominent and he was in the news and he was talking about technology and we had uh, a lot of attention being given to different companies and their their knowledge of technology etc um, and so I was invited to speak but um, they asked me to speak not so much about the rest of my experiences but just specifically about what I knew and recalled about alien technology so I put together a speech with corroborative evidence from several experiencers who can describe the same technology that I was able to describe in a speech. And um, for the first three mornings of the five-day conference, I took the exper I assisted taking experiencer sessions in the morning. So there was another uh, a hypnotherapist taking one room full of experiencers, and I was taking another. And uh, these two gentlemen, two guys came in who were a little intimidating in their manner, although they didn't create any fuss or anything, but um, they wouldn't join the group in a circle. They sat behind me, which was a little intimidating. Um, and I couldn't ask them to leave because we had an open door policy to the meetings. Um, so I gave my speech at nine o'clock in the morning on Saturday and um, Saturday evening I attended the banquet with about 650 other conference attendees. Um, at one point in the evening I f felt I needed to go to my room because I had a serious back injury and I was on crutches and I was feeling really tired. So I left the auditorium, um, the banquet room, and I went out into the corridor and there were these two guys were standing out there. The rest of the corridor was completely empty. There was no one around. And the moment I came out through that swing door on my crutches, they they came away from the wall that they were leaning on and got one behind each of my shoulders. Now I had it in my mind. I've got to get to my room. It, what I should have done was just turn straight around and gone back into the auditorium where all the people were. But um, for whatever reason, my mind was focused on getting to my room. So I headed off down this long corridor and they were kind of pushing me like this, their shoulders, um, asking me to tell them, saying that I obviously knew a lot more about alien technology than what I'd said in my speech, and that's correct. And uh, they were wanting to know 
what I knew, um, demanding to know what else, what other kinds of things I knew. Um, by the time we got along the hall to the foyer of the auditorium area, um, the conversation with me had become a bit more sinister. They said, um, we want you to look up a couple of websites and you can, and they named those websites, and they said you can see the kind of technology that's being developed that can actually be used to harm people and you better not talk about this anymore um, or you can be harmed. And they said, and, uh, and it goes for your family too. So this was very intimidating and um, quite nasty. Um, and then they sort of, after they'd finished threatening me, they just turned and walked away to the car park. That was uh, quite an experience. The next day, um, I didn't see any sign of them around the conference, so I figured they'd gone. Um, but that afternoon when I was getting prepared to leave the conference and I was going to be flying out to LA, um, I went down along my corridor where my room was towards the lift and there was a strange looking lady standing outside the lift. It registered in my mind that she looked odd because it was a very hot day and she was in very hot, warm clothing, like a woolen skirt and a woolen jacket and a, a high-necked sweater. Um, it just looked odd in, in such a hot desert weather. And um, she had a wig on and sunglasses, and I thought, well, that's a bit odd. But um, my mind was on other things, so I got into the lift and she followed me in. She stood in front of me by the lift buttons and um, we had to go down, I had to go down two floors to get to the lobby and we stopped at the next floor. And just before the lift stopped, she put her hand up and she sprayed something like that. And I thought she was spraying perfume on herself but the spray came over her shoulder and it hit me in the face and all over my neck and shoulders she then the doors opened and she rushed out of the lift I shut the doors because I was going down another level but that meant I was shut in the lift with the spray it was a very sweet smelling smell it made me want to vomit straight away um, it made me feel ill and I just thought it was cheap perfume so um, I got my bags ready and that. I left for LA. I um, stayed a night and I flew out the next night to New Zealand. By then I was starting to feel unwell. By the time I got home, I was extremely unwell. And the next morning, my husband had to take me to a medical center and I was taken to hospital with a life-threatening condition. I had... Um, a bacterial skin infection, bacterial lung infection, and bacterial blood infection all at the same time. I nearly died that night. Um, and it was a, apparently an unusual cocktail of three lung bugs. Um, and um, the strange thing was that in the early hours of the morning when they thought I wasn't going to make it, uh, apparently there was an American specialist in infectious diseases who just happened to be, have traveled down from Auckland to our small city where I live to stay a night. And the medical specialist at the hospital knew about her and knew where she was because she had been lecturing in New Zealand. And they phoned her up and asked her if she would come into the hospital in the early hours of the morning and look at me. So she did, and she saved my life. Um, I don't even know what her name was, but she um, she changed the uh, the drips that I was on. I and she said, I remember her standing over me saying, "Mrs. Hansen, you're going to get worse before you get better." And I did over the next two hours, and then I started to pack up. But it took a week um, in hospital before I came home. So. Um, do I believe that someone tried to take my life? Yes, I do, because um, I happened to read on Facebook at some stage after that um, about another uh, um, researcher who died at the conference. He died in Phoenix Hospital. He was took himself to hospital on one, on one of the nights um, because he was very ill, and I have since communicated with his fiancée 
and she has told me that he contacted her and told her he had been sprayed in the lift by an unusual looking lady sprayed with a substance that that was sweet smelling and made him feel ill and he died in hospital of a bacterial a virulent fast acting uh, lung infe- um, infection from a bacteria so um, he was also writing a book at the time about technology and um, and I was speaking about technology so this is a very unusual thing Timor because at this time we had um, you know, Academy to the Stars, Tom DeLonghi, we had Luis Elizondo, we had all these people coming forward talking about alien technology and it seemed to be quite fine for them to talk about this sort of thing. So why is it that an experiencer talking about this sort of thing is silenced or they attempt to silence you? Why, what is it that I was saying that was so threatening to whoever that they wanted to silence me? And they wanted to silence this other researcher. Um, that's uh, that's a very intimidating thing that's out there, um, and and I don't know where this will go from here because now I've gone public with this. That this is what happened to me. It happened to this other person, and uh, and he died. Um, this isn't the first time that this sort of thing has happened, and since I have publicised it. Um, recently in some interviews I've had a number of experiencers and people writing to me saying um, the same sort of thing has happened to me and and I've gone quiet because I was too scared to carry on Mm. Um, but I think we have to carry on yes I know it's risky but um, but you know that's what we have to do well it's quite sad thing in the first place that uh, we, uh, you have to go through this kind of thing. But uh, one question, uh, you said that it was uh, kind of uh, destroying lungs. Corona does the same. Is there any, mm-hmm. co- any connection? Exactly, <laughs> exactly, yes. But, um, but there were other aspects to it as well. So, um, you know, I had the blood infection and the skin infection. So I must have either I scratched myself or they may be, the two men may have scratched me and I may not have even noticed it. But it's interesting that um, that the skin infection occurred right where I'd got the spray. So it was all over my neck, shoulders and head. Mm. And uh, all of that area of my body went bl- bright red with um, cellulitis from a bacterial infection. Mm. So yes, um, yes, I, I see the link to uh, the coronavirus also attacks the lungs, but um, yeah, I, this is I didn't, something more deadly. I, I didn't feel it was that. Mm. I think it was something different myself, yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, it sounds that uh, it it is much more deadly what they were spreading to you. And yeah, it was a it was a, bac- mm. it was a bacteria, not mm. a virus. Yes, this this is what I thought. Well, um, when you have those uh, connections and uh, encounters with uh, these uh, alien races, uh, have you received uh, some kind of uh, special abilities uh, because of this connection? Well, I wouldn't call them special, but um, but like many like many experiences, I I guess I have quite well developed um, psychic capacities. Mm. Um, I often have uh, premonitions of things that happen. I don't like making predictions, so to mm. speak, but I will quietly say to my husband, "Well, I've been told this, or I've been told that." And um, and he'll go, oh yes, okay, and then it will happen. So um, yeah, it's it's not something that I go out and publicise, but um, I guess I use my intuition all the time. Mm. Um, and I describe in my book how I was taught to to recognise changes in energies and recognise certain energies around people and what that means and how to cope with it. So um, I describe, I spend a whole chapter describing that in my book. So I think that uh, most experiencers have been have been taught these kinds of things or have been 
um, subjected to situations uh, from right from childhood where they learn these kinds of things. So I have memories of sitting around with groups of children, um, learning to do things with my mind, learning to perceive things with my energy field and my psychic abilities. So I guess like many experiences, it is more well developed perhaps than the average man in the street. Well, I'm sure <laughs> there, that is. Well, uh, consciousness has been uh, quite a big part of uh, every contactist training, I believe, because uh, this uh, uh, physical uh, season, uh, when you see, go to the by physical body, it's lasting just some time, and then you start to use your consciousness. So, what kind of uh, is this kind of consciousness training? How they uh, train your consciousness to do those trips uh, without the body and uh, so. Well, I think we all, um, we all, le I believe that we all leave our body anyway in our sleep state and we mm. go elsewhere, we learn things, we go to what some people call the spirit world or whatever. Mm. Um, so that is leaving your body in your soul state anyway, which we all do. So experiences use that capacity um, to go on board a craft. And I have memory, for example, of coming as a ball of light and just going straight through the wall of the craft, through into the um, inside, through some more walls inside to the room where I needed to. Be, I knew I needed to be to um, to talk to two greys. So um, it was like a, a, a business meeting, if I can put it that way, <laughs> that had been arranged at a certain time, and there I was. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it has taken place in that form um, with me as a ball of light, and other times um, I've found myself that I'm, I feel I have a physical body and I'm there as a physical person. Um, and then I exit again as a ball of light. So I think there's so much more that we will learn in the future about our ability to transform from, from one state to another. And in fact, the, the greys have said that in the future we will be able to do extraordinary things that, that, that they can do now, which is normal to them, but to us is extraordinary. Yes, indeed. There is a different, uh, like when you see in dreams, it's uh, sometimes that uh, all those dreams are not so very clear and very consciousness. It's just a, uh, some kind of stream of pictures and, and something uh, uh, from day, daily life. And, but then there is also those kind of that you are waking up uh, in the middle of dream and you are uh, fully aware of your surrounding and of yourself. And even then there is something different than uh, when you are going uh, uh, out of your body, that uh, you are fully, totally consciousness when you're going. So is there uh, some kind of stages of uh, uh, consciousness that, uh, that uh, what we can uh, use for traveling, that uh, if we don't want to uh, go, <laughs> example, uh, with out of body experience that we have at just some uh, uh, level of our consciousness which we decide that goes to the trip. <laughs> Is there some kind of levels? So you mean um, instead of the, the soul leaving the body, you mm. just have your consciousness leaving the body? Yeah. It, it, like your Do you mind see the uh, same thing or uh, is there uh, some kind of different states of uh, consciousness which can leave the body? Well, I'm not sure about that. That's a very good question, actually, Timor, and, and I'll have to really think about that and examine some of my own experiences because that's a good point. Um, for example, as a 12-year-old, I left I, I left my body, but I didn't leave my body as a human. Mm -hmm. I left my body as the, the grey soul part of my soul mix, if I want to put it that way. So... Um, that being the case, then it's entirely possible that aspects of us mm. can leave the physical body and go somewhere else. Um, uh, I know that when I incarnated, I, I have memory, um, I, I have a flashback memory of prior to coming into this life, which I had. And this flashback memory plagued me for years. I, I wanted to know more about it. And after many years, um, I decided to have a regression, and um, and it turned out uh, the whole 
story or the whole situation around that memory came out. And that was that when I was coming into this life, my consciousness was um, deciding how much to take from my soul state. So my soul state drifting up there in the field of consciousness was woken up and was and selected a life to go into, was presented with some lives, selected one of them, and then decided how much of this to take into that life. Mm. How much knowledge I've acquired over many, many lives, how much of that did I need to take with me for this life? So that implies that our consciousness can split and it can be um, part of it here and part of it in this life as Sue Hansen and part of it up there. And then we have um, we have psychologists and, and other people talking about how maybe um, we are leading parallel lives, in which case is some of that consciousness I left behind, has that incarnated somewhere else? Is that now somewhere else doing something else? But it is still connected to me because it's my consciousness. Am I able to then tap into that sometimes and and um, and sense something of the what the rest of my consciousness is doing? What happens to the consciousness I left behind mm. in, uh, floating around up there somewhere? So there are mind-boggling questions and possible answers to this whole question idea of consciousness and um you know it, it's unfathomable sometimes you you just you don't know how far the whole thing is going to go eventually and i think that um the ets have spent lifetimes with some with us humans um teaching us the very basics and and being very patient with us, knowing that in the future we will understand more, but we have to take those baby steps first. They can't move us forward too quickly. It would blow our minds. Hmm. And um, <clears throat> in one of the chapters in my book called um, A Glimpse of Cosmic Culture, I was taken into a room with seven other humans and a number of greys and other species, and they were trying they were doing an experiment if i can put it that way to see how far we could take our consciousness they we watched them dissolve their bodies into like a, a mist and they were trying to encourage us to let our consciousness go and let all our fears go of of disintegrating and to see if we could actually do that none of us could but it was the most um one of the most emotional experiences that I've ever had on craft and it's interesting that Dr. Rudy Schild an astrophysicist in the States who contributed to my book uh, when he was looking at my manuscript look chapter by chapter he at one point said send me some three chapters that you think I'm going to you know think is a bit unusual a bit too far a bit too far and I'll have a look at those <coughs> So I sent him three chapters, and this particular chapter was one of them, and I thought, well, he won't be able to understand this. So even I don't understand this. And he came back to me and said, in terms of physics um, and cosmology, this is the chapter that I understand the best. So that was confirmation to me that, um, you know, that that he understands that these things are possible and and. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, no he problem. talked about how he has equations for some of those things. Well, Fine. we can uh, take uh, some uh, little break uh, right now because uh, it's uh, normal that uh, when we are doing longer uh, period, uh, then we are just making break. And now sounds that the uh, break is uh, in good. good. Uh, so I'm uh, putting uh, some music now and uh, then we're going back. Okay. Okay. So you, see you soon. Know. All right, we are uh, continuing uh, our interview with uh, um, Susie Hansen. And uh, Susie Hansen uh, are in uh, New Zealand at the moment, and I'm doing this uh, my own part here in Wax. So. <coughs> wow. <laughs> that wasn't UFO, actually. <laughs> Just. <laughs> 
Well, there is uh, some question uh, which uh, um, is about uh, concerning about human uh, that uh, when we humans are developing uh, as a species, uh, uh, evolution takes us uh, with uh, well. <coughs> How those uh, uh, extraterrestrial races uh, um, uh, influencing human uh, evolution? There is uh, those hybrids and so on. But can you tell us something about more of this? <coughs> Sorry, did you say hybrids? Yeah. How how those humans um, evolution uh, is uh, touched by aliens and touched by uh, touched by aliens, and when we are thinking about exam example hybrids, what what hybrids, what is uh, made? Uh, well, um, there's a lot being said worldwide at the moment by certain researchers about <coughs> hybrids uh, or new humans. Um, the concept of new humans has been around a very long time. Uh, in psychology and other other professional groups thinking about this over the years and how we are influenced by te our technology and how we are um, we change according to the changes in our environment. It's not that we're special or that we've necessarily got um, ET genes. It's just that's part of evolution, as you have said. And evolution isn't just the physical body. It's the it's the the whole human and um, and our environment around us and and what we create as humans. So um, I think that uh, a lot of people today are saying that they're star kids or they're star seeds or whatever. Um, when in fact we are just um, a race that is developing and evolving. And yes, there are people out there who um, I describe as the first wave of souls that have come in to assist with the evolution at this time on the planet. Um, <clears throat> but that doesn't necessarily mean to say that they are hybrids. Mm -hmm. However, um, I have been told by the ETs that, um, that many experiences have been genetically altered in some way. Um, I was told that I had been. Um, and my son, so therefore there is this uh, process in place that is assisting us to be enhanced in some way. I don't think it's completely clear um, yet in what way we have been enhanced. Right. However, um, I do have some evidence of that that I have seen and observed and experienced myself, and um, I'm writing about that in my next book. <clears throat> And this information may be a little controversial and it may, it will not match what some researchers are putting out there at the moment who are theorizing on this and not always listening to what experiencers are saying about it. So um, I think there's getting to be um, a bit of a, a rift between what experience is, know and understand, and what some prominent researchers are putting out there. Uh, they say that it's based on uh, information from experiences, but um, but I also feel that it may also be uh, their pet theories that they are searching for something that might support that theory. So, in in effect. Um, some researchers are creating the contact field, creating the information themselves, rather than following the research and following what people are saying. I've had personal experience of this being interviewed by a researcher um, about 18 months ago um, who was giving a speech and wanted to, my perspective uh, as an experiencer on something to do with the soul. And I think um, if you read my book, you'll see that I'm I'm actually I actually feel I understand quite a bit about what the ETs are doing with souls, uh, human you know humans and their souls. Um, so this this person, this researcher, interviewed me, um, but she interviewed me through the eyes of her own personal theory on it. 
So she, I didn't feel she was listening to me as an experiencer and what I was saying. She was trying to uh, align it with align what I was saying with with her theory. And the conversation ended after about an hour with uh, this person asking me the same question, but couched or um, phrased in about eight different ways, trying to get me to agree with her theory. And I didn't agree with it. It was not what I had experienced, and I could only say what I had experienced. But she didn't want to accept what I experienced because it didn't match what she was theorizing. Yes. So... um, so the conversation finished, and sh- and she was quite upset, quite annoyed, and um, I had been told by her that m- the interview would be on the website, and uh, you know it would be my input would be used in a speech, but it wasn't. So why wasn't it? Was it because it did not fit her theory? In which case, this researcher was not researching what experiencers have experienced. She was trying to find something that would align with her theory. Mm. That is not research, and that is not um, uh, giving any kind of respect or or consideration to an experiencer who's been willing to speak to you. So um, this is an example of how what we say is, is being uh, misinterpreted. And I think there are some researchers out there in a contact field who who have created um, a little niche for themselves and they are competing with each other, competing for conference invites, um, competing with their books, etc. And, um, and I think that they are <clears throat> not being fair to the experiencers and I think that more experiencers need to be heard as speakers um, and the researchers, if they want to research, that's fine. But when you research, you consider all of the data and you present all of the data. And you allow the, the you can express your opinion, but you allow the, um, the reader or the observer to make up their own mind based on your what you have presented. Um, you don't present what you think and only what you think and only what matches what you think. <clears throat> well, uh, if we're thinking about uh, this kind of um, evolution of what we are going through, uh, as you thought before we went to the, this break that um, uh, about this um, <clears throat> uh, consciousness, how it's splitting uh, with uh, uh, human uh, and uh, with uh, uh, this um, extraterrestrial consciousness. So basically, we are evoluting ourselves uh, in that way as well, that uh, our consciousness is getting information from two different sources. <laughs> is it going like this? Or what do you think? Um, <clears throat> well, certainly some experiences. Um, uh, I talk in my book about the dual soul. Mm. <clears throat> and um, in some experiences, not all, um, have been in a program, and I describe these programs in my book with the ETs, education programs, and what I call enhancement programs. Um, and that has, for some of experiences, that has involved the soul, enhancement of the soul, um, and not just uh, the human body or their awareness or their education, but actually the soul and from prior to birth, before that soul incarnates in the body, it knows what its task is going to be and uh, it knows that it's going to have constant communication and association with ETs and that there is a purpose for this, which I describe as the the, uh, alien agenda. There's a lot of people talking about agendas out there, so I acknowledge that mine is only one of a number of agendas that people are talking about. but and the agenda, the uh, evolution of our soul and our consciousness is going to be very necessary uh, from the position that we are in now of not knowing a lot about it um, consciously. 
it's going to be necessary for any future open contact with ET because um, everything they do is at an advanced level of consciousness from, from where we are at present. So their communication, their technology, their way of life, the way they communicate with each other, the structure of their, of their living and their daily life is based around consciousness and telepathy. So um, in order for us to uh, be able to relate to them on any sort of level, uh, we as a civilization need to raise our consciousness and, and, and our understanding of it. Um, Otherwise, uh, it's going to be a very daunting experience and it will be a fruitless experience trying to um, have, have communication with a species that is far in advance of us in terms of consciousness. And this is why um, experiences, it's, it's quite normal. This communication with ET has become very normal because we've been doing it from childhood. If you thrust that same situation on a civilization many of whom have never thought about UFOs or aliens and don't want to know about them, um, what is the impact going to be in terms of consciousness and in terms of the fear factor and the, the um, impact that it would have on society in general? Yeah, <clears throat> I'm thinking about that um, when uh, normally when consciousness will uh, um, evolute uh, this uh, how, how much we are aware of this world how much uh, we can uh, get information about situation what we are going through and and how much we can understand uh, uh, this information what is given to us in our consciousness uh, this is uh, somehow evaluating and uh, and uh, getting uh, clearer and uh, more wider picture and uh, and so on. I th this is what I thought that um, that uh, when you have uh, some uh, genes uh, from uh, uh, extraterrestrial, is it also bringing that kind of knowledge, <laughs> possibilities and awareness? Yes, I would think so. And um, you know, at, at the same time, we've got the the soul that has has been enhanced. Mm. Um, through consciousness with ET consciousness and then we have the physical body that can be enhanced through genetic manipulation mm. or intervention so we have this uh, this dual situation where for many experiences the the contact is quite close and um, and when they are in the company or the presence of ET they are able to raise their consciousness very quickly closer to the level of the, of the ETs to be able to um, complete tasks on a craft, etc. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Even those people who um, who have had what they report to be negative experiences, a lot of abductees talk about having had ne negative experiences with ET, but at the same time, um, their consciousness was able to operate at such a level that they were able to communicate with the ETs and vice versa. So therefore, there there is still some uh, there's still been some raising of consciousness and uh, and enhanced awareness, um, even though they have found some of their contacts or all of their contacts to be negative. Well, um, have you had uh, that kind of uh, encounters with uh, some um, negative alien race? No, I haven't. I've um, I have yeah, not had negative, <laughs> yeah, I haven't had um, negative experiences at all. But I have had experiences that, um, on the face of it or on the surface, were initially quite daunting and frightening. For example, that missing time experience at age twenty, I did not relate. Um, the contacts that followed in my twenties for a while, I did not relate that to the. Um, to the happy contacts I had as a child, um, it seemed different, but it wasn't. It was just that my fear had been enhanced by people around me and by um, some of the books coming out of the States that I read in the early stages um, were, as I said before, quite negative. And so reading those books um, gave me the wrong impression or put fear into me about what might be happening to me. And I had a situation um, in my early 30s that was a catalyst situation where, um, where three ETs 
appeared in my hallway at night and um, and I found myself standing there with my son and we'd been put into an altered state and for whatever reason I slipped out of that altered state and um, at that moment I could hear them and understand them talking to each other and I started communicating with them and when I realized that I'd slipped out of the altered state that I um, was communicating communicating quite happily they one of them said to another it is time for her to remember more and from that point um, I began to remember most of my experiences in real detail and um, so that that um, barrier that they just put there in adulthood just so that you could carry on leading your life being a mother or whatever that little barrier of of uh, altered state that where you wouldn't rem necessarily mem remember a lot and it would be less disturbing in your life was removed and from then on my my um, contacts uh, were much more meaningful for me because I remembered began to remember much more mm. um, have you <coughs> um, have you had that, that kind of experience that uh, you have noticed that uh, they can uh, actually manipulate time. Is it uh, how it's possible to manipulate time? Have you uh, heard any kind of uh, experience up, uh, or explanation from it? No, I don't. I don't know how they do that, but I have experienced it. For example, I write in my book about where I was standing at my kitchen bench. My family were sitting in the living room in front of me. Um, and my sons were playing. One was sitting on my husband's former husband's knee, and one was playing on the floor. And um, then there was what what is called the Oz factor, where everything starts getting a little um, blurry, and sound seems to recede far away. I could hear the noise of the children playing next door in a property next door, but it seemed to get further away. And then I saw five balls of light come through the wall and into the living room. And I remember saying out loud, there's, there's some balls of light come into the room. And um, my eldest son looked up and he could see them too. My former husband couldn't see them, but my eldest son could. And he said, yes, mum, there's, there's five of them. And he named the colours and he was correct. So, um, and then suddenly everything just, seemed to go black um, and we we he and I had this experience of probably our, our consciousness or our soul leaving our body and but the body remained standing at the bench and it was as if the everything in that room for those people was frozen in time and then sometime later um, it all came back to life again so suddenly it's like you suddenly woke up and I'm still standing at the bench and my son is on the floor with his little trucks and he looks up at me and he smiles and he smiles a smile that, as any mother knows you can read that smile and what it means and it was like um, it was like a shared thing it was like I know mum I know what just happened it was that that look of complete understanding whereas my husband my other son didn't have a clue it was like time came together split like this and we went off somewhere our consciousness went off somewhere for some time and this stayed like this and then it started again from that point so it came up to this point started again from that point so there was what I call a time slip what experiences call a time slip where time was spent somewhere else but no time seemed to pass here mm. so you came back and it started again. This is very interesting. Um, I have um, two friends uh, who had an uh, interesting uh, experience together. And the uh, <coughs> thing was that they was uh, uh, in Peru. And uh, they was uh, uh, going to the restaurant, but uh, all those uh, doors and everything was closed. and. Uh, uh, and uh, it seems that uh, those Indian ladies who has uh, uh, come to the road and uh, doing those uh, food for next morning and and everything like this and 
uh, when they came back to the hotel, uh, time was changed. <laughs> uh, it wasn't a uh, night yet, and they, uh, there were two different people in same uh, same experience that they couldn't. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's it, it it wasn't just one person but two persons, and uh, this was uh, one interesting thing that uh, there was uh, some uh, mul somebody uh, manipulating time, or did they just uh, pass? Uh, Parallel, uni parallel uh, mm -hmm. universe or something like this, parallel reality, uh, or because uh, this is uh, something uh, unusual happen. <laughs> mm. Yes, and um, that's a very interesting, Timor. And I know a lot of experiences talk about the, the same sort of thing where um, something can happen and they find themselves in the same position, but things around them have changed. And they don't, they haven't noticed this this time happen. And um, a young lady I know in the states uh, had an experience where she was driving in her car. She's a young experiencer, and um, she was about to have an accident. She saw a car hurtling towards her. She knew it was going to hit her, and um, a split second before it hit, she found herself in her car, but two streets away. Wow. And how do you explain that? <laughs> so she wasn't hit, she wasn't injured, it would have hit her in the driver's door, possibly killed her. Mm -hmm. And she was in a t terrible state and phoning her family saying, this is what's happened, you know, I can't explain it. Other than that, it was like she was transported in, an, in a flash of time, two streets away. Very, very interesting. What do you think about mm -hmm. uh, uh, parallel uh, realities? Is it possible? Have you had oh, an sure own experience? I'm sure it's possible, yeah. I don't know if I've had experience of it, but um, but what I co said before about how um, part of your soul essence can be left mm. behind when you enter into a life, um, it makes sense that you, you may be somewhere else and that may be a parallel universe. Mm. Also, I think um, if we look at some of the strange things that happen around the world, as you've just talked about, mm. and some of the places where unusual things happen, um, for example, you know, the Bermuda Triangle, etc., are we looking at some intersection of some other reality that is taking place in those areas? Mm -hmm. And the ETs, um, the Greys, have talked about places on our planet where the energy is, is uh, different. It's not as the rest of the planet. And they, they tend to avoid those places when they're traveling around in our atmosphere. So um, that could be that these places are intersecting with something else, some other reality. Yeah. And, um, you know, we see uh, stories coming out of places like the Bermuda Triangle and there are other places in the world where unusual things happen. We've got a place in New Zealand called the Dome Valley where very strange things happen. People's consciousness or the reality around them is suddenly very different and then comes back to normal when they're traveling through this area. So it's, I think it's quite well documented way back in our history that there are these places where there's some intersection of our reality with something else. Well, life, life and uh, world is very... <laughs> interesting place and uh, many things uh, might happen and uh, when you when your consciousness has been uh, uh, much more uh, become much more wider and you will get more more of those uh, perceptions of the world and uh, mm. surrounding of you and so wh what do you think about uh, human perception uh, is it uh, possible to have somehow developed in that way that uh, you actually uh, get some kind of uh, stronger connection uh, to, to those uh, ETs, example. Uh, so, can you just clarify your question, Timo? Um, yes. Um, what do well, uh, this uh, our perception skill, uh, how we make perceptions uh, about world and about uh, in, in our consciousness. Uh, that uh, yeah. is it possible to somehow expand this kind of this kind of consciousness that uh, uh, human uh, can uh, can be seen by their bare eyes? Example, this uh, uh, another 
reality or something where those uh, uh, eating example are or they can uh, somehow contact them much more easier is there uh, that kind of expanding uh, oh point? absolutely i think our our awareness and our discernment and our perceptions are expanding all the time mm. and that's part of um of our consciousness um expanding mm. the more we become aware of what is um what exists around us and I think of uh, mediums and clairvoyance people who are able mm. to see spirits for example that's that's perception of another of another um, form of reality that's around us mm -hmm. and um, the ETs have actually told a group of humans I was with um, on one occasion that as time goes by our perception of these other realities will become clearer and um, we will be able to see them at will and we will become aware of other um uh will they use the word uh, entities and life forms that exist around our planet mm. so um these are for example some of the entities that mediums see um are, are not human like they're not they're not your classic gray or or mantid or reptilian either there's something else mm -hmm. um, which many mediums see in their work and so I think that um, that as people m move more out of their self-focused life and be become broader in terms of a more holistic attitude towards humanity and the world and and animals and nature and mother earth um, that is one of the things that helps to expand that awareness and expand the consciousness. Mm. It's all about education and learning and experiencing. And if you're not interested in learning um, ex ex learning about UFOs or spirit world or anything else, then you're less likely to experience it. Or if you do experience it, it might be because it's important that you wake up at that point for some reason. Mm. That crosses over into the question that a lot of people ask me when I'm speaking overseas is um, people come up to me and say, look, I feel like I've just woken up. I feel like um, there's something I have to do in life. I feel as if I've got a task that I have to do and I don't know what it is. Can you tell me what it might be? Well, um, no, I can't tell you, but I can I can help you to examine uh your life and, and your interests and, and see where uh, your skills lie and that might help people in discovering what their task in life is. But I think a lot of those people are experiencers who've, um, who've been uh, sleeping, if I can put it that way, and it's time that they woke up and did their particular task. But it's also a sign of humanity seeking to expand its boundaries and expand its consciousness to more into the unknown and the par what people might call the paranormal. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm taking a one uh, experience uh, from a chat room. Uh, 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 this kind of nickname, Oblivion Strain, is uh, writing in English. So. Uh, it, it, at the age of four, I experienced a uh, time of stagnation at the funeral. All the quest stopped and remained still. Someone spoke something to me, but I don't remember anything like the praise that was. <coughs> praise that was uh, greeting, I remember that the event uh, completely, that the event complete, even when I was four, downright frighteningly accurate. Okay, I don't know, did you, did you manage uh, to follow my uh, <coughs> Okay, <laughs> I think so. So this person at the age four was at a funeral mm -hmm. and they experienced time kind of standing still, is that correct? And mm -hmm. during this time they heard a voice talking to them, but mm -hmm. it wasn't the prayers that, they, that were going on at the time, it was something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that correct? I guess so. I yeah. guess so. That was a short experience. Um, people are thinking about uh, when we are talking about this, our level for level of um, reality that it's uh, one uh, frequency of the energy where we are at the moment, and uh, uh, this frequency uh, are different. Uh, example for those uh, uh, space races uh, that uh, they can. Uh, 
be in the same, uh, exist in the same place, but they are a little bit uh, in different uh, frequency that your eyes cannot mm -hmm. see. Uh, for me, I got uh, one uh, dream, uh, uh, which was about this, that uh, I was waking up uh, fully consciousness in my dream, and there was this uh, little fellow uh, telling me that, uh, that uh, I should uh, follow him and, uh, and uh, he will tell me something. And I was following him and uh, this was this uh, light uh, brown uh, species, uh, similar than those greys, but uh, uh, light brown. And uh, he was uh, taking my hand and uh, said that, uh, showing that the uh, sky which was uh, full of stars and that, that this is what you see normally. But uh, soon you will see how, it's, uh, how it will be in normally. And when he touched my hand, I started to see how those stars starting to, uh, stars starting to move and there are coming uh, lots of uh, traffic to the sky. And this uh, little fellow said that uh, this is how it is, but this is what humans doesn't uh, still see. <laughs> so it was kind of a different frequency. <laughs> That's very interesting. So you're talking about the traffic being um, UFOs? Oh well, yeah, it seems so because they was uh, uh, obviously they was uh, moving, uh, uh, showing in that way that uh, they yeah. are alive. That's really interesting because um, I mean they can uh, they can um, allow you to see what they want. Mm. I mean they can alter your perception um, in to protect you or to educate you or whatever. So mm. that's a really interesting um, experience you've just talked about. Mm. Yeah. Um, and if I can just get back to the previous person too, um, mm. I've experienced that myself where I've been in a situation and it's as if everything has stood still and, um, and something else has been happening at the same time. So for that person who put in that, uh, that, that comment, um, that can either be uh, the spirit world that could have been a, a spirit person or a family member who's passed on speaking to them, or it could have been something else like ET. But um, I would say in that situation, it, it was probably the spirit world mm -hmm. um, where they became their consciousness became aware of this conversation directed to them um, rather than the prayers that were going on around them and perhaps they were given some comfort or information during that time, I don't know. This uh, Olli Paiulaf, who is uh, ex-apolitic, uh, who lives in uh, Italy, was uh, writing here that uh, the space-space continuum is physical level, but consciousness can be on the le level of that. Yes, that's mm. right, yeah. Mm. Mm. Yep. Uh, this is that kind of guy that uh, you should uh, co contact to him. <laughs> okay, uh, that's Paolo in Italy. Uh, only, uh, only Paola. It's a Finnish, but he is living in uh, he is living in uh, Italy. You should contact. Uh, okay. Mm. Uh, he he can contact me, which might be easier. <laughs> yeah, might be. <laughs> so I don't know which contact mm, him. Mm. Well, uh, let's move on. Let's move on. Uh, Let's talk about a little bit about this uh, current time what we are living and and those new te technologies uh, what are uh, coming uh, coming to here. What do you think about this five G, five G technologies? What is yes, that well, for you, um, man? I think that there's a lot. Um, it's only coming to New Zealand and Auckland at the moment, um, not anywhere else, as far as I'm aware. Um, there's a lot of conspiracy theory, theory stuff out, all over the internet about it, but yeah. um, I I do think that we already have some technologies that are, are harmful to humans, and um, I'm always suspicious of something that is um, going to affect our health or going to um, manipulate <laughs> society in some way or create situations where um, our privacy and our... Um, our health and our um, at w which may be surveillance. So we already have that happening in the world, and um, the ETs uh, have talked to groups of humans they've been in over the years, and have talked about how in the future it will be essential for us to be well away from from that kind of technology. Um, 
because talking about frequencies, these kinds of technologies can interfere with our frequency and um, be harmful to us, but also um, uh, there's going to be greater surveillance in the future. And they talked about how what I describe as the third wave of mm. uh, souls incarnating at this time um, will are the most adept at um, communication telepathically and that that will be the way that they will communicate with each other and form networks worldwide as telepathically mm. because it will be the only safe way. And even that in the future may not necessarily be safe because we have... Um, some universities in the States, uh, like Berkeley University, for example, who are running programs funded by DARPA, which is the scientific arm of the CIA, and they are developing um, technology to do with mapping the brain, knowing what our thoughts are, reading our thoughts, etc. So we're moving into a time when um, when new technology is is going to uh, have ethical issues around it and as to how much input the man in the street is going to be able to have on that, I don't know. Um, how much will be decided for us and imposed upon us mm. is more likely the scenario at this point. Yeah. And um, what's happening with the virus at the moment is a perfect example of that, how um, laws have been implemented under the guise of the virus to, to support the um, you know, uh, getting past this virus, but um, we don't know what lies further down the track, as you said, with a second wave of the virus and what laws will be brought in at that stage if that um, second wave is much more harmful. Mm. How bad is the uh, corona situation are at the moment in uh, New Zealand? It's I not know too that, bad at uh, all. I know that the you are just uh, as I am, uh, we are isolated because we are uh, yeah. having own issues. Um, well, all of New Zealand is isolated. We are um, under lockdown. So everyone has to be in their home unless they're going to the supermarket or an essential service. So we have our own bubble of people we can have contact with in our family and that's all. Um, we're not allowed to have contact with anyone else. Um, we have only had one death. Uh, we went into lockdown very early because um, we we rely on a tourist industry in New Zealand. That's our second biggest earner for the country, and um, we have you know hundreds of thousands of visitors every year, and um, and we were concerned about them come bringing in the virus. Particularly, there's a, a large um, amount of Chinese come into the country so when news broke that there was this virus in China there was uh, immediately began to lock down on Chinese visitors um, so it's not too bad here we have um, probably I think I haven't looked at today's tally but I think it's about 800 cases most of whom recover or are recovering we've only had one death and that was an elderly person with existing health issues mm, yeah uh, have you <coughs> received uh, some kind of information from the ETs about this, uh, what we should uh, warn about uh, in the future, what kind of, uh, what kind of um, devolution will uh, lead uh, to the bad, bad rails <laughs> or any kind of warnings? Okay, yes, um, right back in the 80s and 90s, um, I recall warnings being given by them and it's interesting to note that most of these um, occasions were <coughs> on very large craft or in underground bases and it's interesting to note that um, there were humans there working with the ETs so this was the, these lectures that took place for large amounts of people around 250, 300 people were um, the the humans were part of the chain of communication and chain of operation. So there were a lot of humans around working with ET. Um, and on these occasions, we were warned about coming events. Many people have said to me, um, well, what year is all this going to happen? <clears throat> they didn't tell us that because they... 
They talked about our evolution and the things that happen on our planet as being like an elastic band. So um, some days you can pull the elastic band out and we've gone quite a long way with our consciousness and our understanding. Mm. We're doing really well. Other days it'll snap back to here because there's a war broken out or some other terrible thing has happened in the world that has dragged down our level of, of spirituality and conscious and conscious understanding. But um, they did warn about a number of things that would happen. They were not did not isolate when it would happen, but they said watch for these signs. And one of the signs that they talked about was when there would come a time when there were large amounts of humans who had nowhere to go spiritually, geographically, physically, in every sense of the word, they would have nowhere to go and they would be wandering and moving in huge masses. And when I spoke in um, Europe in 2015 and 2016, um, that's when the the uh, many of the immigrants were first coming up through Europe and through Italy, and my husband and I were going down through Italy at that time, so we saw firsthand what was happening. And this has since happened all around the world, in Africa and parts of Asia and um, in South America. We have these huge amounts of people on the move um, with nowhere to go. So that was one of the big um, warnings, and I said that this would be accompanied by um, by a lot of um, earth changes, and we have seen that happening as well. We've seen more severe weather worldwide, more unpredictable weather, and we've also seen um, a lot of uh, earthquakes, mudslides, you know, all, mm. all of the kinds of uh, earth-related tragedies that can happen, tsunamis, etc., all happened within a fairly short time of being given this information on board craft or, or underground. Mm -hmm. So um, given the fact that I and many other experiencers have been shown on screens and on computer consoles um, massive earth changes that are absolutely shocking and be far beyond anything we have experienced yet, I would say that the coronavirus is a very good practice run for getting ourselves together ready for survival, getting community and country um, operations sorted out, civil defence sorted out, so that um, we can function and try to survive under those kinds of circumstances. I don't think they would have shown us those things if they weren't going to happen. We certainly in New Zealand um, are quite used to that sort of thing. We've recently had White Island erupt and um, kill a, num you know, a number of people died as a result of that. It's a volcano here off our shores. Uh, we've had major earthquakes which uh, flattened parts of one of our major cities. A lot of people died, buildings collapsed. So um, we are seeing more of this worldwide. We're seeing the ring of fire really come into action with volcanoes all around the, the Pacific uh, Rim. So um, I think that this is a, is a golden opportunity for us to um, get our act together in terms of um, procedures for survival. But at the same time, I think we have to be very wary about um, what limitations may be imposed on us that uh, go beyond human rights or that are taking away our freedom to make some choices ourselves. And my biggest concern is that what that there will be mandatory vaccination. And my concern is what may be in that vaccination um, if it is going to be given to people worldwide. And it may be um, a condition of future overseas travel where you may not be able to travel or visit a country unless you've got that vaccination. Mm. We already have that to some extent with, um, you know, diphtheria and some of the vaccinations we have when we go to tropical type countries. But this could be a much broader sweep, which um, may not be a good thing. We don't know. So I think we have reason to be very cautious about what may happen from this point on, Timor. Mm, yes, yes. Well, uh, 2009, when there was this uh, big flu, uh, big influence, and uh, there was those vaccinations, that brought uh, problems all over the place, uh, all over the world. 
because of those narcotic, uh, narcolepsies and so on. But um, <coughs> uh, well, it's always when you develop the, some vaccinations and so on, first ones you don't know what happened, uh, how, mm. how they are uh, affecting because, well, and uh, it's also that um, when uh, this uh, virus is spreading all over the uh, world now, how, how it will be, uh, example, mutate. Now we are talking yes. about two different yeah. strains that uh, LNS, uh, which uh, another one is more deadly than another and, and mm -hmm. so on. And, uh, but anyway, maybe there will be a second wave also. <laughs> mm, yeah. That's right. I think the mutation of it is a is a concern. Um, you know, uh, I've read some experts saying it could weaken, and others saying it could um, hit some countries really badly. So mm. it's um, it's a wait and see. And certainly here in New Zealand, we really don't know what is going to happen next. Um, mm. There's no been no time limit put on the time that we will be in lockdown and uh, it's a case of waiting to see what happens in this country and worldwide. <clears throat> yes, yes. Well, that, that has been a very interesting uh, conversation and a very interesting subjects. And uh, do you have something uh, what you would like to share before we are finishing this uh, conversation and this uh, uh, online broadcasting? Well, I'd like to say something actually really basic, Timor. Yes. <laughs> and that is that um, people need to get together uh, what we in New Zealand all have in our homes, and it's a survival kit. Um, I'd, I'm not a prepper, as many in the States are, and I'm, I'm, I don't want um, to worry people either. But I think too many people are unprepared in their home and in their community for... Um, surviving extreme weather, surviving uh, um, earth changes, and I think that there's going to be much more of that. So I think people need to look after their personal safety and get together at least the minimum of things um, to put in a, in a survival kit that you can uplift and take with you at any time. But apart from that... <clears throat> I would encourage people to use critical thinking on all on all things. There's a, so much information out there. It's a, an absolute data and information saturation, and um, and I think you you really need to do your own research. You really un, need to think critically about what people are saying, and not just follow the trends that are coming out and and the uh, you know the big names and the the big the big egos that are out there um, putting all kinds of information out there as if they are the expert of the moment. I think you have to be really careful, develop your discernment and um, and think if, give give good consideration to all sides of, of every issue and make up your own mind. Indeed. Uh, thank you for your wise words. Um, in the end, uh, what good you have seen that this corona has brought to the world? Um, well, I think it's made people aware of uh, their community. Mm. And um, if anything is going to help you in the future, uh, if there are earth changes and, and uh, severe weather, it's going to be your community. It's going to be the people around you that, uh, that you associate with on a daily basis. And um, and I think also it's made us realise as a nation, as a, a civilization, how ill prepared we are, and we are not globally connected in terms of dealing with um, a global issue. There are countries who are like naughty kids, really. They are good. They're doing their own thing. They're not. Um, they're not focusing on communicating worldwide. And as Michio Kaku, the theoretical physicist from the States, said, um, you know, there are different stages of the development of a civilization to move from, from a global civilization through to 
an intergalactic civilization, which is far away at present for us. But the sad thing is, Timor, we are not even yet a global civilization. And one thing that this virus has done is make us realize that there's this big disconnect between so many countries. We have these political barriers and we have um, all kinds of trade barriers, etc., which prevent um, us forming a cohesive civilization that is a global sort of civilization. So in Michio Kaku's words, we are not even on level one yet. Mm. We haven't made it to level one. Yes. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Susie Hansen. This has been my pleasure. And stay safe you, and keep doing uh, very good work what you are doing. And we will see you someday here, maybe a little bit. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> sooner. Hopefully in Finland. Mm. And uh, now <laughs> Thank, in you, <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to uh, interview with you and lovely to see you again and um, all the best to all of your listeners wherever they are in the world. Keep safe and um, and I hope to see you in Finland one day, Timo. Well, you have to take <laughs> your husband and come come to Finland. Uh, say to the Thomas yes. uh, greetings from me that uh, this crazy Finn is uh, inviting you to the visit. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. But okay. Uh, uh, now now to the audience. Uh, kiitoksia yleisölle, jotka olette olleet seuraamassa tätä keskustelua uh, Susi Hansenin kanssa ja tästä tulee olemaan myöhemmin sitten nauhoite tästä tässä niin tota, kanavalla ja. Ja perjantaina meillä onkin jo eksopolitiikko oli Pajula täällä puhumassa, puhumassa niin tota eksopolitiikan aiheesta ja monesta muista, joten palataan perjantaina asiaan ja, ja sunnuntaina sitten uudelleen Matti Salon kanssa. Kiitoksia kaikille ja hyvää yötä.